This is the Skin Science Podcast. I'm Dr. Thomas Hitchcock, and here we'll investigate everything skin science and dissect it from a scientific perspective, analyze it from a medical perspective, critique it from a consumer perspective, and give insight from an industry perspective. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Dr. Thomas Hitchcock, and with me in the studio, once again, we have Angela Wilson McDonald. I am here. How are you, Angela? I'm great. Yeah, I'm here. I'm glad to be here, as usual. Is that a question mark? I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. (laughs) No, I'm thrilled to be here. Okay, and we also have sitting at the table in Dr. Jones's seat, Jose Maldonado. (laughs) How are you doing, Jose? I'm doing great. I'm having an amazing Friday with you two guys. Oh, Oh, isn't that nice? He wants a raise. (laughs) (laughs) And he's. Let's clarify. He's Dr. Jose Maldonado. Dr. Jose. Yes. So sorry, Dr. Maldonado. Okay, well, and we have in the back, we have uh, our producers, Seti and Alan. And then uh, from the last podcast, we have Ndashe Kumungu. I'm, I'm You're getting, killing it. Am I, You're am killing, I killing it? it? Yeah. yeah, am I killing it? In a good way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then today's, uh, this episode's puzzle is one of my favorites. This one is called Excalibur. This is made by somebody in, uh, a guy named Philip Black in the UK. And I got actually the first, the very first one. Wow. Uh, so this is 3D printed, which is actually kind of a, a hit or miss thing because they can be really kind of crappy when they're 3D printed. But this thing is really, truly one of my favorite puzzles. It was a mint to buy. We'll not say how much it cost, but <laughs> um, it was a mint to buy, but it uh, gave me a lot of fun to solve. Uh, it reminds me a lot of The Legend of Zelda. And for any young man that's around my age, you will remember the Nintendo when Zelda oh, came out. I it changed Zelda. lives. Yeah. Um, the hours spent playing Zelda. This this is like a live kind of Zelda. Even though it's King Arthur, it's kind of like Zelda. Anyway, uh, if you ever get a chance, I did a, I did a video on my website that I uh, solved this, and it's actually um, a lot of fun. So if you want to see how that's solved, check it out. If not, this is the puzzle. Anyway, let's get to the point of today's podcast, which I'm going to uh, defer to Dr. Maldonado to let us know what it is. Yeah, so thanks for having me again. So today's podcast is going to be different forms of yeast. And I'm really excited to jump into this topic because it's something that I've been working here at Crown and with Dr. Jones. You want to talk about bread making? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, let me start by saying but yeast is an umbrella term for multiple species of different fungi. Because yeast, uh, for those who don't know, is actually a fungus. I know we use yeast for breaking, uh, bread making, but it's also a yeast that you, uh, yeast can also be found in our body, on our skin. So it's part of our... Um, and, and inside. Inside, yeah. yep. So it's part of our, what we were saying in our last podcast, the holobiont. So it's all around us. And one of the reasons I'm really excited to talk about this topic is that if you look at my face, you won't see a pimple, a zit, or any acne. Well, oh, 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 okay. <laughs> <laughs> a little just shade, kidding, a little, a little Friday shade. Okay. You know what? Don't zoom in. Okay. But I, I do suffer from body acne. Okay. And, and the reasons I was excited to jump, uh, talk about this is when I go to the gym, a lot of the people I work out with, we also uh, suffer from body acne. Well, I think at the mm. gym, you might have other reasons why they have body acne, <laughs> yeah. but go ahead. You know, and when I started going into, uh, you know, we go to those websites that you type in your symptoms and what you got and, and see what, what pops out. You know, one was saying that Which I had... We do a, not condone these websites. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly, because <laughs> one of the websites were saying that I have a fungal infection caused by yeast. But another one was saying that I had a body acne was called by C. acnes. Mm-hmm. And I'm like... Wait, let's hold mm. up. Like, I'm getting two different answers. Yeah. So then I'm like, let's take a pause. Let's go back into the literature. Let's do go to Google Scholar and let's see what the what the research says. And what I'm finding is yeast could potentially have a much bigger role in acne development, not just in our body, but on our actual our faces than people are acknowledging or want to acknowledge because it's so dogma now that C. acne is the bacteria that causes acne. And I'm, of course, I'm here with the experts, at Dr. Thomas and Angela here, um, to you talk about this my joke. You oh, I was going to say I am shocked. when he called me an I expert. I am shocked. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> well, uh, uh, I, Angela, I think you're an expert. Thank <laughs> you, know, you. you. I think you're. Thank you. you know, yeah, you think whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I really wanted to jump into this topic, and maybe why isn't yeast, or specifically the species of yeast, or the strain of yeast? Well, how come we don't talk about this enough, and how come they're not getting any blame, and it's always just C. acnes 
is the root cause of everything when it comes to acne. Right. I think, again, I, my joke was kind of, a, I was going to make a joke about like being shocked that this <laughs> evidence is coming forward. But the fact is, uh, yes, this is very pertinent. It is something that I've been shouting from the rooftops for years now about the fact that C. acnes is not uh, the culprit that we make it out to be. And the, and the other thing is, um, we need to start the uh, kind of discussion by the fact that we are discussing particular right now fungus mm -hmm. is a kingdom uh right yes uh, and so that's a lot of things that we're talking about fungus mm -hmm. is a big there's a lot of things that are fungi uh there are a lot of bacteria um and c acnes is a species but we have a lot i don't know if we've yeah we've talked about this on the on the podcast but also in beauty and the bacteria we've talked about um the fact that it is strain specific about what either drives pathogenesis or benefit when it comes to bacteria. And the same is probably true with fungus. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's one of those things where a lot of people don't realize how distinct a strain is versus a species. And so in my, um, uh, in my current, in the recent lectures, I've, I've found that using analogies have been very beneficial. And so I'm, I like to use the uh, idea of uh, a wolf versus a beagle. And because I have a beagle and, and he cuddles with me and he licks me and he loves me and he sleeps next to me at bed, in bed and stuff. A wolf would not do that. It would eat me, uh, you know, and, or it would bite me at least or it'd eat my beagle or something, you know. So uh, the fact is those are the same species. A wolf and a beagle are the exact same species. They are subspecies. And so th the thing is you can see some of the similarities, right, between a beagle and a wolf. Um, and, uh, but you also note the very big differences. And so that's when, we, when it comes to things like fungus and bacteria, we have to start our discussion with that in mind, is that we have a kind of body of literature that has basically said, this species does this. C. acnes causes this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've seen some of them say uh, Malassezia, which is one of the bacteria yes. we're going to talk about. It's a genus. Yeah. That means there's a lot of species under that, and then there's a lot of strains under those species. And so by saying this does this species does this is very reductive. Mm -hmm. But we can st I just wanted to start with that framework because we're going to get into some publications. So for instance, you you did say that you looked up on the internet and you got two different answers and that does not surprise me mm -hmm. at all. If we go to episode number 1 of Beauty and the Bacteria, we saw that when I looked up what is a bacterial related disease, I had people saying malaria. Uh, we had people saying the flu. They have nothing to do with bacteria. Those are viruses and, and other uh, unicellular bacterium called plasmodium. While I can understand the mistake because they're microbe-related diseases, because a microbe is a unicellular, small little, uh, they're not bacteria. And you might say, well, that's a nuance that doesn't matter. Yes, it matters a whole lot because I wouldn't treat plasmodium necessarily with an antibiotic. Or I wouldn't treat a virus with an antibiotic, but you know, there's a lot of people that do. They get a cold and they go get an antibiotic because they think it's going to cure it's me. Everything. But yeah. it doesn't. If anything, yeah. causes dysbiosis, which is going to make your life worse, possibly. You know, not always, but possibly. So um, that being said, all right. So you said mm -hmm. you got you went to the gym and you got scabies. What did you say? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you, you no, got, I, wow. I suffer from a lot of back. Look, if you okay. look at my back. You know, and um, back, uh, body acne is tied with, you know, going sweating, you know, gym clothes get dirty, the moisture uh, traps in there. And that's a perfect, uh, a moist environment is perfect for a fungus or this yeast um, to grow in. Right. And could be causing these breakouts on my back. Right. You know, I, I remember as a kid thinking to myself, why do I wash my towel? Because when I get a shower, I'm clean, right? So why do I need to wash my towel? Gosh, I wish my kids would think that. <laughs> can't imagine the <laughs> amount of laundry in my home. But also, you know, I, the reason I'm bringing that up is because why do we wash our towels? If, if we take a shower and we sud, we sud up and we wash yeah. every nook and cranny, why do we have to wash our towel? Our towel should just be clean. We, we just well, wash yeah. ourselves. So yeah. wh why do we wash our towels? I'm asking legitimately. Why do we wash our towels? It just seems like good hygiene. You get good hygiene? Not every time, but every, I would say every two to three times. We, you know, I, I encourage reuse of towels in my home. Encourage <laughs> is a very strong word. I personally do it. My kids choose not to. Okay, you're not falling from my, you're not falling into the, the answer should be very apparent. Why don't we? No, yeah, well, why do we? Why, why, why do, do we? we? You know, why do we wash towels? Why, why don't we just, if we're clean when we get out, why do we have to wash them? Because we're just drying off clean oh, bodies, because right? Because we're led to believe that they have to be washed every time. 
by marketing and consumer. Okay, you're 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 <laughs> on the bench, Jose. Your turn. Well, I was just gonna say. I mean, well, we're transferring stuff to that towel, and the towel can I mean it's absorbent. So if absorbing water, water can stay in there. It's probably bacteria can grow on these towels, and that's probably one of the reasons we wash them. Okay, you're so, right. But what else is on our bodies that transferred? Well, you know that likes uh, moisture uh, fungus yes <laughs> oh so i should be washing my towels of 100 <laughs> percent oh and your bed sheets gosh, my kids were right <laughs> i'm gonna go home and apologize right now so the, the the thing is you also have to remember that these things live in our houses in general and so if you have anything that's moist it doesn't have to come in contact with our bodies there's other th sources of mold and and mm -hmm. other yeasts and fungus and stuff than our bodies but we, when we wash ourselves, remember, no matter how clean you think you are, you still have microbes <laughs> <laughs> and yeast and fungus. You have billions of bacteria and yeast and fungus. Billions of bacteria, and, and, we, yeah. think and awesome. we think that's awesome. And we think that's awesome. So really, that's the reason I brought that up is because um, I just wanted to drive home that um, you're not going to get rid of fungus. Mm -hmm. It is there already. So what you mentioned about it being kind of driven by wearing j dirty gym clothes or wear wet gym clothes, how does that contribute? If you already have fungus on your body, how is that contributing? You know, well, one of it's contributing because when to current that uh, that moisture we have that's getting trapped in our skin uh, between the clothes, it's creating that perfect environment for that yeast to grow. And of course, you know, that moisture also has other food and other food sources that that, ye that yeast is probably eating and it's producing something, some kind of metabolite that's probably irritating my skin and causing that breakout. Possibly. Remember mm. also in the gym when we, it's not just moisture, it's sweat, right? Sweat, yeah. So sweat has salts. Has a, It's a very different environment you've now produced mm -hmm. than is typical of your skin. You basically have moisture on the outside as well as uh, electrolytes and other things. Uh, so that being said though, why do you think that acne is caused at all by uh, yeast? Where did you see that? So I was looking into the literature, and one, just doing some glances at the literature, they were finding lots of pathogenic strains of yeast on acneic lesions. And when they were also comparing that to how many, uh, how many amount of C. acne strains, they were finding way more yeast than C. acnes. And I'm like, wow, that's, well, hold up here. Why, why if we're finding more yeast and less C. acnes, why does C. acnes get all the blame and we're not looking at yeast? Two, yeast, we see they're, they're more active and they are actually hydrolyzing more of the sebum, those uh, oils that our sebaceous glands are producing. And some of these, uh, what they're actually producing is our, and you asked me this yesterday, this, they're actually producing unsaturated fatty acids. And some of these unsaturated fatty acids are known to cause abnormal keratization and, um, and some of those comedones, op uh, black kids and whiteheads that we see. Can you, can you describe what uh, an unsaturated poly... Or, uh, an unsaturated fatty, fatty acid. Fatty acid. Uh, what, what, can you give an example? Sure. Um, so when you think of some... Um, <laughs> if it knows an okay answer. <laughs> or we just think like, you know, a butter, that's a saturated fatty, a f uh, fatty acid, correct? But, um, well, it depends on... Yeah, okay. Uh, but I was thinking more like these... Um, no, I'm sorry. You, put me on the okay. spot. you got no me worries. nervous. No worries. No worries. You can cut that out if you want to. Um, so... Okay, let's let's take a little bit of a turn here because uh, yes, you're right. Some uh, some of the fatty acids that are metabolites of microbes can be a little more inflammatory. There are others that are actually really good for us that are like the short chain fatty yeah. acids, like um, a score. Um, let's see, uh, propionic propionic acid, uh, butyric acid, ascorbic acid, not ascorbic acid. Um, what's the what's vinegar? Come on, guys. No, it's not citric <laughs> acid. That's from oranges. Come on, what, what, vinegar. Come on. Where's Brian when you need him? All right, anyway, <laughs> vinegar. Uh, and so uh, uh, it starts with an A. I'm drawing a blank. Acetic acid. Acetic acid. Um, is that it? Yes. Yes, yes it is. <laughs> it's getting late, guys. Um, okay, so here's the thing, though. You, you provided me some interesting documentation mm -hmm. about uh, yeast and, and fungus being associated with acne. Now, this is something that I've been thinking about for years. Um, because I, you know, it's no secret that I believe that C. acnes gets a short end of the stick here when it comes to acne. That being said, uh, I, uh, what I came across uh, years ago was this publication in 1989 that showed three case studies 
where uh, two men and one woman, separately, mm -hmm. not related, uh, two men actually were taking um, testosterone. So they were injecting testosterone for whatever reason. Uh, it was a legitimate medical reason, uh, apparently. Uh, it was not an uh, unusually high amount of testosterone. It looks like it's about, um, in one of them it was uh, 200 milligrams per week, which is not, not that much. It's a little bit more than typical, but not that much. Uh, and so they were finding they were getting body acne. Mm -hmm. Uh, when they would take the testosterone. And so actually they were given for uh, another reason, I think it was, uh, I can't remember what, I'm not gonna go through and read it, but they were given Nystatin, which is actually a drug that's an antifungal. And they were given oral Nystatin, so they were ingesting it at uh, relatively uh, significant doses. I think one was uh, like 500 milligrams six times a day, the other one was like 250 milligrams twice a day. Uh, and they all found, both men and the woman, the woman was not having testosterone treatment, but she was having uh, issues with acne as well as um, vaginitis. And so we do know that, unfortunately, in the vaginal canal, it's a very moist and uh, mm -hmm. hospitable environment for yeast. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this particular woman was having issues with that. All three of them, when they were taking the oral nystatin, the acne would go away. When they stopped the nystatin, it would come back. So it's pretty evident that the nystatin <clears throat> based on these case studies was which being an antifungal um, not an antibacterial uh, was ridding their systems of this problem with acne now that being said one of the publications you, you gave to me mm -hmm. which I think looks like a review article mm -hmm. basically says melesthesia which is a genus uh, of fungus mm -hmm. has thought to has been thought to induce acne as it is the most prevalent uh, yeast in the skin, uh, genus at least. Yes. And then this other publication you gave me uh, basically says that uh, the less that acne patients had less malassezia in their skin than people that uh, had healthy skin. Mm -hmm. So uh, about 50% uh, people had fewer ac fewer malassezia than in the people that had normal skin, 70%. So what what do you have to say about that? Well, once again, we were talking about species specific and strain specific. Maybe we're not picking up those specific strains on these patients because a lot of these new papers are using uh, 26 ribosomal sequencing. That C 26 or 16S? I think this one. Because I don't think they have 26S. 26S. Yeah, it's 26S. 26. But, you know, but still, mo many of these new methods are doing uh, metagenomics where they're taking samples and sequencing to see what's in that, uh, in that biome. <clears throat> As previously before, um, people were just swabbing and trying to culture and think. And you said this before that a lot of times the things that grow on our faces is uh, bacteria that grow, but the bacteria, sometimes they're uncomfortable. They can only be culturable. culturable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't culture them. And they can only be the perfect environment just happens to be in our face. And we're missing out on so many species that we're not capturing, you know? And some things we, as uh, scientists, we just start clumping things together. Mm -hmm. So maybe in this case right here, it could be a case that they're just missing things because they're not, you know, maybe not sequencing deep enough or didn't get enough of sample. You also, we've also talked about here on this podcast that <clears throat> how you sample matters as well. Um, and some of these papers will have different sampling methods. Some people just do the swab, whereas other papers I've read do the, um, I believe, or it's called the D squeaming or the D squeam where you just actually the strip sticker. the stick. You're actually stripping. There's others that use yeah. the, uh, what do you call it? The little thing that pulls out the comedone and, mm -hmm. or the, the, the pilosebaceous filament. Um, there's actually, what I'm, what I was trying to get at yeah. here is that there's, there's some papers here that you've provided me, which, uh, basically say that it's actually the candida oh. genus that actually is what is causing the pathogenesis here. Now, all that being said, I think what the biggest point here is, is that the, what we call the mycobiome, which is the fungus in the uh, biome of the skin, okay. uh, is actually understudied and underappreciated. And so if you go back to the, all the evidence that I present when it comes to uh, C. acnes and all that stuff, a lot of the studies are done just looking at 16S, which is specific for bacteria. So in the follicle, I'm always saying that, you know, up to 90 plus percent of the follic follicular bacteria, C. acnes, we're not looking at fungus. And so in this, in some of the studies that were provided by Dr. Maldonado here, um, there are some studies that do talk about, okay, well, what is in the, in the follicle unit? And some say, well, there's a lot of melesthesia in there. There's a lot of C. acnes in there and some uh, staphylococcus. And we know that uh, with the bacteria, we know the proportions that are associated with acne. Now we need to start learning about the fungus because the idea is that it's possibly 
that fungus has a strong association with acne that we need to start to learn. We did, we already knew that there's fungal acne, but we thought it was a different, we, we actually don't call that acne vulgaris. Mm -hmm. And so the real question is, does acne vulgaris, which we think of as traditional acne caused by C. acnes, which it's not necessarily, um, uh, is that associated with yeast or fungus as well? Yeah, um, and there was one of the papers, I don't know if you got a chance to read it, but there was a paper that was really interesting that said, if we took a sample and we're finding less E. acnes and more yeast, mm -hmm. could it be, and if, could it be that the yeast are somehow over proliferating mm -hmm. and taking over and displacing the uh, C. acnes? Meaning we need it? <laughs> what? <laughs> that <And> is shocking. <laughs> so maybe there's uh, some kind of negative interactions between the micro and the microbiome that's going on that causes acne. And oh, there definitely And is. we haven't, like you said, we, it's very understudied because... Uh, Right. It is understudied, but it is studied. It, so it's I, being studied. So the fact is you found a number yeah. of articles. And and to be honest, I think Angela can speak on this is because, you know, marketing tells us it's bacteria, bacteria. I don't, didn't even think about this because I'm so used to, you know, we are- Killing acne causing bacteria. Yeah. Yep. Uh, we hear acne on our Instagram feeds, on our TikToks. All I hear is take this, this kills bacteria, gets rid of your acne, mm -hmm. or this, 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 and it removes the bacteria. So I didn't even think about this as a possibility or anything that fungal could be related because I'm just so used to hearing that bacteria is, a, is the reason behind our acne. And I just took it as face value and never really don't get to it anymore. Right. And that, uh, that is something that we've been trying to change is we've been trying to change the way that people look at the way the biome is composed, the ecosystem of our skin and how the things that we do, whether it's medicinal or hab habitual or, you know, whatever is, uh, contributing to disease states. Now, that being said, um, I do want to, this is a perfect, uh, topic for Dr. Doris day, the friend of the podcast. Uh, and the friend, I would say best friend, best friend <laughs> of the podcast. Uh, and so before we bring her on, I did want to mention, um, one thing that at some point, either in this uh, half hour or in the next one, I want to talk about, um, typical, uh, things that we use to solve acne and how that affects mm -hmm. the different parts of the biome and whether or not we may be finding that maybe the way that some things that we know work, work is different than we thought. Mm -hmm. Angela, right. you actually asked me this question a few days ago as well. Yeah, so my thought just sitting here listening to it, again, as you all have heard me say, I have a child that suffers mm -hmm. from acne who's been on antibiotics. So are we potentially killing the bacteria yeah, yep. that's allowing, and then allowing the yeast to overgrow, and it's actually the yeast yeah. that's attributing to the, yeah. to the acne long term? Oh, and one last thing is that we do need to realize that the, 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 the publications that are studied, we've talked about biofilms before mm -hmm. in, our, in our discussion. These biofilms, there are studies that show that certain fungus can actually commandeer the biofilms of bacteria, meaning they can basically say, I want to live in your house and kind of go Move in there. In. Mm -hmm. That being said, they don't always get along. So that interaction, because if I'm a person doesn't want somebody in my house, I'm probably gonna, I could either passively just go somewhere else or I could fight. And if they fight, does that contribute mm. to what we see manifested as mm. inflammatory skin issues? That's a really interesting question for me because I'm currently looking at some of the antimicrobial peptides that healthy C. acne secrete to keep staph and other things out. And the question is, if you have an invasive strain of a yeast or you do something that causes the yeast to become more prevalent, which then they are now in an ecosystem where they're producing things they shouldn't, like wearing clothes that you should have mm -hmm. changed out of or something, that is going to change the game, and that may be why we're seeing some of these things. The, question, the thing is, on the face, what are the implications versus the body? Because the right. body, you know, we can explain How away by yeah. Yeah. clothes and mm -hmm. stuff. The face, though, a lot of people would disagree currently in the paradigm that we live in right now that it is acne vulgaris is caused by any type of yeast. But that is changing mm -hmm. because of this body of evidence. And that's where I want to bring in board certified international superstar dermatologist, Dr. Doris Day. Doris how are you doing? Always great to be on with you. Yes, and it is great to be on with you as well because we have something that uh, I'd like to get uh, some, I'd like to pick your brain about. Um, and that is uh, yeast. Yeast and not baking yeast, but yeast that is on our bodies that uh, is associated with 
uh, acne. Now we know on the trunk, uh, we typically, uh, a lot of people will admit that you do have fungal acne, but they call it a, a very different thing than acne vulgaris. But um, the research that we've been discussing today basically suggests that malassezia or candida or these different types of yeast may have a stronger association with the development of acne than was previously thought. Um, what is your thought on that? Because I've been saying this for a while, but it's one of those things where I want to hear what the history is uh, of how people have been thinking about this and why they decided it had nothing to do with acne vulgaris, but now we're starting to see evidence genetically that it does possibly have that connection. I, I think it's really just that as information evolves, as we understand better, sometimes with some of these organisms, they're very hard to culture. So when we do a culture, if you can't grow it, we assume it's not there. Right. But malassezia can be really difficult, if not impossible, to culture. And so unless you do a biopsy of the acne and look for it, you're not going to see it. And no one's really going to biopsy to tell you you have acne that's malassezia based or candidal based. The... Other issue is thinking about whether that's causative or commensal and sort of a red herring. And that's another part where we kind of discuss and argue and dissent amongst ourselves. I have found that when we address it as both, we get better results. The problem is when somebody comes in and they're fixated on, I have candida, they think that they have it in their system. A lot of times they're wondering if they need a pill that's going to knock candida is what is what it's usually called yeah. out of their system and they think that they're infested with it as if it's crawling on them and then the next thing comes up the next wave of popular things like for a while it was adrenal stress right. that became the thing that everybody had that was driving whatever ailed them so there's a lot of little information and even misinformation that have non-specific findings that drive people to think that if I do this, all my problems, my life will be better. When in reality, it's none of that. It's really sometimes just making small changes. And, and I think about it like if you were driving in the rain, you don't want to turn the wheel fast because you're going to skid and end up in a circle. Mm -hmm. You want to make slow adjustments to your, your routine, to the products you're using, to your diet, to your behavior in order to see that change. And that's when you can really see a difference. And right. that's lasting. Yeah, right. And, and as we know, acne is a multifaceted um, in, inflammatory yes. issue. And so if you're changing everything, you'll never land on the one thing or two things. It could be multiple things that you're doing. It could be nothing that you're doing. It, it could be one thing. Correct. You know, it's one of those things where I think you have to, that, that's why you should consult a physician, right? Because they're yeah. going to help you think through um, now, I will say what you mentioned about they're not going to biopsy to see if you have a fungal infection. The, the fact of the matter is, I hope at some point, we don't want to biopsy in the sense that you're taking a chunk of tissue, but doing genetic analysis, doing uh, microbiome analysis or mycobiome analysis in this case can give us some better insights. And like we've discussed on previous podcasts, unfortunately in medicine, we don't typically do this right now. And even if we do it, we don't yet understand what it means. And so, right. yeah. And, and we don't have treatments to adjust for it, but I'm thinking about doing tape stripping. So it's not a biopsy, but that tape stripping would have to get to the base of the follicle, yep. not just the top of the skin, because you taught me this so, so well. And it was just such an eye opener how so much of our skin surface is just below what we see on the surface right. because it's in follicles. That's right. And that's actually more than what's on the surface. So we'd have to find a way to tape strip and get that, a sampling of that part of the skin in order to see what's growing there, what that biome is like, and what we need to do to adjust it in order to help the skin help itself get healthier and, and resolve that issue. Right. You know what? I... I, now I have a question because there's some, you just mentioned that uh, we don't really know what to do with that data or how to treat based on that data. But that being said, I actually have some uh, research that was done in 1989, or not research, but case studies in 1989, as well as uh, some stuff about benzoyl peroxide that I want to talk to you about when it comes to this topic that I'm going to put on hold for the next podcast because we're running out of time, but I think this is a, a topic we need to expand uh, and look at. Now that we're talk we've talked about kind of the differences uh, of how it uh, can be associated with acne despite the other microbes being bacteria or whatnot, we now need to look at what does that mean, like, she, like Dr. Doris Day just said. 
you know, we could get all the data in the world, but if we don't know what that means or how to move forward to treat it better, it doesn't matter. But I do think there's some insights that we can talk about and actually maybe come to some conclusions if we take the time. So Doris, stay put. I'm going to call you back in a few minutes, and then we're going to talk about uh, how we would treat based on knowing better information about the microbiome and the mycobiome. I'm so excited. I'll be right here. All right, stay put. Uh, all right, let's finish this up. We don't have much time left for this half hour, but there is so much good information that's uh, right here on the table that I do not want to stop this particular um, topic. I do want to kind of go further and look at kind of knowing what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. The fact that we know that there is some association with the skin issue of acne um, uh, with yeast or fungus mm -hmm. in, in some capacity. The real question is the way that we treat uh, acne uh, for instance, in years past, was thought we were, we would use antibiotics, and people a lot of mm -hmm. times did. Dermatologists are the number one prescribers S of antibiotics. Still happens. Yeah, it's yeah. happened. Still happens. To my daughter in the last thirty days. Yeah, hundred percent. So <laughs> it still happens. Hundred percent. And the thing is, we're not saying that it, it should never be any type of uh, part of the regimen, depending on what is causing the issue here. We don't know until you go to your physician and do some testing. The, the fact is, most physicians at this point don't necessarily look deep enough because we haven't been trained to look mm -hmm. deep enough. We haven't, we don't do microbiome testing. We don't do genetic testing. We don't do necessary blood testing for acne. We just say it's caused by C. acnes. Yeah. We're gonna, and this is, this is how you wipe it out. That being said, there's some things that we use that are relatively successful. And the reasons have been said in the past uh, because they're antibacterial. But the fact is, Maybe that's not the reason they work, mm -hmm. given what we're seeing here. So let's save that for next time because we don't have much time left over. Now, before we leave, I would like to get back to the towels. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. So let's be clear. <laughs> do we, in fact, need to wash the towels you after do. every Go use? Go home and burn them. Oh, no, uh, no, no, not after every use. No, not after every use. The thing is, it's important not to leave your towel on the floor, not because the floor is dirty, but because you need to let Wet. them dry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if you let they them dry. Properly hung. Yes, if you let them dry, they should be fine. Because you've got to remember, there's a few things. The first is, when you wash... Um, you never really are washing everything off. So you're, you're also uh, wiping off dead skin cells, mm -hmm. you're wiping off <clears throat> sebum, and those things can foster like dust mites and, and uh, fungus and the same bacteria that's also on those things. So those things will all, it's kind of like gonna be slightly a Petri dish as long as it's wet. When it's dry, not as much. Okay. But so, the, so the, the fact is after a while, those things will accumulate and it'll just, it's gonna start to get a little, you know, okay. Dirty. And let's go back to the gym. Okay. So, yeah. Because I'm, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm not leaving the gym. <laughs> oh, we know you're not. Uh, so you're you you're at the gym for three hours apparently if you're. Which Dr. is way Jose. overkill. <laughs> it is. And way. so he's got on gym clothes that are moist. Should, should he get out of those gym clothes as quickly as possible, knowing that he suffers from oh, 100%. acne? Get 100%. out of the gym clothes as quickly as possible. 100%. Shower as quickly as possible. Uh, not necessarily? Not just necessarily. Dry off. Yeah, not necessarily. The thing is, yes, you probably the more you exercise, it's probably more contingent that uh, on when you should shower because, remember, sweat also deposits things on your skin, and so your skin's going to change its envi overall environment by drying sweat. Okay. And so it, it really comes down to how sweaty you were, how oh. dirty you are. The thing is, it, it's all natural in the sense that it's all part of your body's ecosystem. But um, you, and also under, in some of the areas of your body, you're going to become a little bit um, okay. odor. Yes. Odorific. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I would say, yes, you probably should shower when you exercise. It doesn't mean you have to use soap. Because oh remember, <laughs> sweat is, the salts and stuff from sweat are water soluble. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is rinse off with water. Maybe use a little soap in those odorific areas, um, you know, where you, you have other types of soils and stuff. But I would say you definitely do not, I'd never use uh, soaps on parts of my, like my back and my legs and stuff like that, unless I actually get physically dirty, like mud or something like that. Okay. So Fair enough. 
So, Jose, in your three hours at the gym, we're going to ask that before you start socializing. <laughs> <laughs> you change your clothes. You change your clothes. Maybe that's actually bring a second change of clothes uh, at the a, gym. You need, a, you need a couple of changes yeah, of Maybe clothes. some different outfits. Yeah. One for socializing and then one for the gym. There one you for go. a workout. And, then... and let us know how it goes yeah. with the trunkle acne. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I think at some point you're probably going to see some more uh, products on the market that are specifically geared towards antifungals for mm -hmm. the trunk. Uh, because the more we learn about this, the more we realize, uh, you know, that might be what we need. But that being said, we have to be careful because mm -hmm. we do not want to do what we did with antibiotics and have the same problems we did with that with the fungus. Because, frankly, fungus can give you a lot more problems sure if you can. piss them off yeah. than bacteria mm -hmm. can. Mm -hmm. So um, I will tell you, uh, let's not uh, just jump to a uh, conclusion, go everybody get tenactin and start smearing it all over <laughs> their bodies, right? So uh, always, as always, Consult your dermatologist if you have a skin issue that uh, you feel, uh, you know, is out of control. Do not self-remedy uh, with things that are atypical. And, of course, we're not giving medical advice here. We're just giving some science to help you bring it to your dermatologist, and then they can help you to decide what's mm -hmm. best to do. All right. Anything else you want to talk about before we get off? No, I think that's yeah. good. All right. Uh, let me get my blurb that Jose forces me to say <laughs> in the very episode. Uh, my name is Dr. Thomas Hitchcock. There you go. All right. <laughs> And uh, if you want to see some more from uh, what we're doing here at Crown, look us up on Instagram at Crown Laboratories on Insta or uh, any other social media. Or you can go to our website at crownlaboratories.com. If you want to contact me personally or see what I'm up to, or the puzzles that I do, the places I go, things, the speeches I give, then go to my Instagram at dr.t.hitchcock. Uh, or you can go to my website, dochitchcock.com. And uh, I thank you for your eyes and your ears. Uh, we hope you gleaned something from this conversation and we will see you back next time. Goodbye for now.